Okay, so let's start. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Jonna Kulmuni, and on behalf of all the organizers, I would like to welcome you all uh, to this seminar. Uh, be before we kickstart the seminar series, I would like to say a few words about the, the network in general. So we are ESEP funded special topic network called Integration of Speciation Research. And our aims are, yeah, our aims are to promote a framework for integrative speciation research and tools for comparative analysis. And towards these ends, we are planning to organize workshops and planning to start a speciation database. And another aim of the network is to promote integration of species and researchers and diversity and inclusiveness in our field. And towards this end, we have uh, planned this seminar series. And the seminar series uh, has the following format. We have two talks today that last about one hour in total. And after that, we have a general discussion of about 30 minutes. And this general discussion will be in another link. We'll post it uh, here so that you can join that link after the talks. Uh, the seminar series runs once per month and the time slot alternates between 5 p.m. CET when we are now and 9 a.m. CET. And this alternation is designed to promote uh, inclusiveness from all corners of the world. And today, our topic of the seminars is bridging the gap between macroevolutionary patterns and microevolutionary mechanisms of speciation. And to stay tuned to what's happening with the network and the topics of the next seminars, you can follow our Twitter or then go to our website and join a mailing list where we will send updates about the seminars and and the uh, activities we plan. So now I'll hand over to Liz Scordato, who will introduce our first speaker. And the seminar session will be hosted by Liz and Chris Cooney. Great, thanks so much, Jana. Uh, well, it is my pleasure to introduce the first speaker of this seminar series, Dr. Leonie Moyle. Uh, Dr. Moyle received her PhD from Duke University, was a Center for Population Biology postdoctoral fellow at UC Davis, and is now a professor of biology at Indiana University. Dr. Moyle's integrative research program focuses broadly on the processes that contribute to speciation and diversification. Uh, her work includes now classic studies on the accumulation of reproductive isolating barriers in angiosperms, as well as cutting edge work on the genetic basis of adaptive trait variation, uh, comparative phylogenomic studies of diversification, and theoretical modeling of the evolution of reproductive barriers. Uh, today, her talk is entitled Down in the Weeds or Up in the Clouds, How Can We Integrate Micro and Macro Evolutionary Approaches to Speciation? So Dr. Moyle, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, you can go ahead and share your screen. All right. Thank you for having me. Let me see if I can do this again. Um... And Sorry, Leonie, just a quick note to everyone in the audience. If you have questions for Dr. Moyle, um, please put them in the Q&A uh, function of the webinar or in the chat, and we will field those at the end of Dr. Moyle's talks. OK. Wow, how exciting to be here. I am thrilled to get a chance to um, speak with this group and also a little bit terrified. <laughs> Being the first is always uh, intriguing because it means that there's a blank slate, but it also means that there's a blank slate. So um, this is a really big topic. And uh, when I first started thinking about it, I thought, oh my goodness, what am I gonna do here? So what I'm actually gonna do when I talk about this theme today, um, because it's been sort of an interesting opportunity to get to crystallize and, and think about some of the nebulous feelings I've been thinking about how to integrate research within my own group is to basically parse this statement. It's to parse the scene that we're talking about, which is bridging the gap between microevolutionary mechanisms and macroevolutionary patterns in speciation research. So what I'm gonna do today is I'm gonna very briefly talk about those two different traditions. I'm gonna talk about 
the gaps between them. So what the, what's the problem we're trying to solve? And as part of that, I'm going to um, move to thinking about what, what's a good solution for thinking about the gaps in this particular case. Um, and there's obviously many more than one solution. So I'm actually just going to focus mainly on one possible bridge that we could and have in fact started to explore in terms of bridging this, uh, these two different traditions. Um, I'm also going to talk about some cautions with this particular bridge and then we're going to be done. So hopefully there'll be time and lots of opportunities for um, interesting discussion after that. Okay, so let's get started. Let's think about the two different traditions. Um, so the, the, I didn't define these traditions, this was given to me. So, uh, but I think it does reflect this idea that there are different ways of approaching unified sets of questions and speciation. So let me just start by saying, I recognize as do we all, that all of us are really interested in very broad questions. What drives lineage separation and diversification? Why are there so many species? Why are there so few species? Why do they go fast or slow? Why are groups similar or different? So all, all speciation research to some degree or another is trying to get at these big questions. And these questions are actually mechanistic questions, whether they be mechanistic in terms of genetics or mechanistic in terms of, let's say, evolutionary forces. Still, um, we do know that these traditions are sort of characterized by different um, features. So in the microevolutionary tradition, they tend to be much more genetic, ecological, or both kinds of approaches. They tend to be manipulative or experimental. They're often really genotypal population oriented. And a lot of the inferences are really bottom up. And so that, that contrasts with macroevolutionary patterns where they tend to be phylogenetic, which makes sense or comparative. They are often much more model-based or computational. Again, this is a, this is a character of that process. Um, there are certainly model-based and computational processes in microevolution as well. But um, as befits patterns of macroevolution, um, they're also very species and clade oriented and often the inferences are top down. So again, this is sort of a cartoon and I sometimes think of these two processes in terms of these two English idioms. So microevolution is down in the weeds and macroevolution is sort of up in the clouds. And part of the reason I do that is it's sort of characteristic of some of the research that we do in my own group. Um, down in the weeds in my own group, we sort of literally handle weedy species. Um, we do hands-on organismal studies, often quite genetically oriented, measuring traits, crossing species, et cetera. Um, but we also think about much broader um, macroevolutionary patterns. So we're up thinking about comparative analyses where we have a broad view of the timing and pace of lineage divergence and its association with species variation. So it sort of uh, in, uh, ev evokes for me some of the research we do in my group, but I think it also captures a little bit of people's concern about the reciprocal weaknesses of these two different groups. So for those of you who are not familiar with those two English idioms, they have particular kind of negative connotations. When you're down in the weeds, you're lost in detail. And when you're up in the clouds, you tend to be detached from reality. And so I think that the idioms also capture this idea that um, there's weaknesses in each of these approaches potentially. When you're lost in detail, the concern is perhaps, are the mechanisms you're looking at telling us anything about the broad causes of diversity? about the patterns that we can see at much broader scales. And when you're um, thinking about macroevolutionary patterns, the, the concern is sometimes, are these patterns really tell us, telling any, anything about the underlying biological processes? So I think they're sort of um, fun for two different reasons to think about uh, this as sort of characteristic of those two different traditions. So given these traditions, what are the gaps that exist between them? So what are we sort of trying to solve really? Um, and the answer is obviously there's lots of gaps. Um, the most uh, evident ones are things like, often they're uh, motivated by really different proximate questions. The, the questions we're answering are quite different. Um, they're obviously focused on different time scales, And because of those two different things, they tend to have um, incommensurate, like they don't communicate methods, data, and inferences. And part of that also is centered around the fact that people who work on micro and macroevolutionary processes often have different set or separate training and culture, and that leads to different expectations of process, which I will sort of loosely call biases in this particular case. 
Okay, so how do we bridge these gaps? That's sort of the goal maybe of today's um, beginning discussion, but certainly of this integration network. And I think the question has to start with what kind of integration we're actually seeking here. There's lots of different ways that one can integrate different things. And so the question is, what are we looking for? So part of the work is working out how, to, how what do we want to integrate? Um, so one concern that I see arise occasionally is that one of the goals is to develop a singular research agenda, something everybody should be working on. And I feel like this is a worry for lots of people. And honestly, it's a worry for me. I don't think homogeneity is really the goal. It's actually fine for us to have different aesthetic leanings and different um, inclinations in what we want to study with respect to speciation. And I think it's appropriate because speciation in and of itself is obviously a really heterogeneous process and probably is as diverse as all of the systems that we used to study it. So we need to be careful that one of the solutions we're proposing is not let's all study the same thing. Instead, my sense is what people are seeking when they think about integration is this fluid of ex exchange of ideas, this um, relatively friction free exchange of ideas and data and insights between different subfields. And so I don't really know what to call this, so I'm gonna call it reciprocal enlightenment. This idea that if somebody discovers or uncovers something in a different um, subfield, that that can filter to me and I can see its relevance to what I work on or its irrelevance, that's okay. And I can um, respond appropriately and therefore we, the, the field, the understanding of speciation can progress. Okay, so let's just say we're seeking a reciprocal enlightenment. Um, how do we get there? Well, obviously there's lots of different solutions and it's a little bit highfalutin, but at, very, at the very least, one thing that we need is a way to communicate. And so one of the things that I think will help bridging these gaps is a kind of a common currency or a set of common currencies, an intersecting and consistent vocabulary, a set of shared anchor points, and, a, and therefore a way to translate inferences from different subfields so that they can speak to each other. Okay, so common currencies, I think, and hope that are the kind of thing that is going to arise from this great network and presumably from some of the talks that will um, come from now on. Okay, so let's talk about, I'm going to talk about specific kinds of common currencies for the rest of the time. One of these common currencies um, or a, a way of using a currency to bridge between these fields is to use system driven bridges. So in other words, it's actually relatively straightforward to have a common currency, a consistent vocabulary, anchor points, inferences, when all of the studies across different levels are focused on a single system. And so we have lots of really great system driven bridges in this sense between micro and macro evolution in speciation research. Some of them are pictured here. Um, we have Mimulus, we have Stickleback, we have the, the lovely Drosophila, which I'm hoping um, Daniel will address in terms of the sort of a system driven bridge between micro and macro evolution and somewhat uh, un unmodestly I've put my own favorite system up there, um, the nightshades. Okay, so you could have a system driven bridge, but let's just say that you don't want to just understand what's going on a single system or in fact, or you don't have some of the resources to work across these scales. What other kinds of bridges can one build that are that represent a kind of common currency and um, the other kind of bridge that I'm going to talk about very briefly or touch upon today is, is, is genomics. Okay, so why am I going to talk about genomics? Well, I'm going to talk about it because I think that it captures an intuition among many of us. And I've been really interested in paying attention to the uh, discussions that have been occurring uh, uh, with respect to the Cold Spring Harbor special issue on, on speciation and much of that much of that discussion has talked about genomics and the role of genomics in some of these studies. So I'm going to talk about this intuition that genomic data can provide a one kind of bridge between speciation studies both in general and across micro and macro evolution. Okay so before I do that I'm actually going to tell you what I think genomic data are because there are also different ideas about that. Um, in my uh, reckoning genomic data are at the very least thousands to millions of sequence variants, so a lot of data, rich data sets, from more than one individual. So you can do comparisons 
um, and that are physically localized within a scaffoldage. So you have some idea of the relationship um, among different variants in a genome with respect to other variants. Okay, so when I say that, I think it's immediately clear why people think uh, intuitively that genomic data are, are going to provide one of these bridges. And that's that genomic data fulfill some of these requirements of a common, common currency, right? They do things like present the opportunity for a consistent vocabulary, they present the opportunity to have shared anchor points, and therefore to be able to translate inferences across different areas or different subfields. Okay, so that's sort of intuitive. And I think a lot of people have that in their head when they think, oh, I'll just do some genomic analyses or let's add some genomics to this particular system. So I think that that's true, but I also think that there are other reasons that genomic data might represent a good, a good bridge. So I'm gonna talk again, very pretty briefly about three additional reasons why, why I think we have this intuition that this is one kind of way of bridging these studies. Um, when, and these are the three ones. Okay, so let me start with the fact that genomic data span more or less all time scales. So this is obviously incredibly useful. From a pragmatic sense, if you can have a data set where you could scope between different levels, this can be incredibly helpful in linking studies and creating bridges. So for example, in our own data, we have done analyses across genome-wide data sets that span, let's say, 30 million years and can link inferences across um, individual lineages uh, from different genera. We can also scope in and have in these data sets to think about uh, genomic variation and evolutionary processes across different species within a specific subclade. In this particular case, it's the wild tomatoes. And you can also scope even further in by picking individual species and thinking about, again, the same comparable data um, within and between populations, and indeed all the way down to genotypic uh, differences between individuals. So again, an extremely practical and pragmatic use of a way of like literally bridging across timescales. So this sounds a little bit trivial, right? Okay, well, that's pretty obvious. But I think it actually is a little bit more deep and meaningful than that. And that's the reason for that is that uh, to think about it, that seamless connection across different uh, timescales sort of respects an intrinsic quality of divergence that I think a lot of us um, accept. And that's that there's continuity. Many people struggle with the idea of speciation because it's really hard to cut nature at its joints and we can see that lineages diverge in a continuous way over time. And so having bridges, having data that allows us to capture that continuity between micro and macro evolution without sacrificing complexity, because we have really rich data sets that suggest that that process can occur differently across different parts of the genome, I think is an important sort of philosophical feature of thinking about using genomic data that doesn't necessarily apply to other kinds of data um, that don't uh, work well across multiple different scales. Okay, so this is another reason why I think it's um, viewed as an intrinsic or uh, sort of helpful bridge. A third reason um, which is related is that genomic data contain patterns. So they're, they're mostly what we're looking at is patterns, but we because we have good models of what these patterns mean, they also imply mechanisms. Um, and so in that way, they can be helpful in linking inferences between more micro-focused um, mechanistically oriented things and more macro-focused, more pattern oriented things. Okay, so to give you an example of that, these are some data from, again, my favorite uh, plant group, which is the um, subclade that contains the uh, domesticated tomato, but it has these amazing diverse wild tomato species. So this is a clade of about 13 species. And these are data that uh, were generated in our first phylo comparative phylogenomic analysis um, by James, uh, Jim, James Pease and various other people. Okay, so what we did is we have about 16,000 loci concatenated and you can build a tree and you can show different patterns. You can show when species diverge from each other, you can show how they're related to each other, and you can connect that with diversification of other kinds of traits. So there's certainly a set of patterns here, but there's also uh, deeper richness in terms of implying mechanisms. So on 
on the left hand side here we have the concatenated tree it's highly bootstrap support for most of those nodes on the right this is subsets of that data it's the same data set but it's different windows of the genome um, and the different windows uh, the different uh, evolutionary relationships that are implied by these different windows in the genome so you can see if you scope down into the genome for different sections of it there's a lot more complexity okay so that is uh frightening but it's also incredibly useful because what that tells us is something about exactly how speciation is occurring in the system so what it told us when we saw it is obviously there's an incredible amount of gene tree discordance and when you dig into that data a lot of that is due to incomplete lineage sorting because there really has been rapid recent divergence um, in this group um, lots of speciation, lots of splitting events piled up on top of each other. There's also plenty of evidence for um, ancient and more recent introgression. Um, and even on top of that, so we have some idea about the mechanisms that are operating during speciation. And then also we can identify individual loci that are having uh, patterns of um, non-synonymous substitution that are consistent with selection, for example. So uh, genomic data, because they're so rich and because we have good models, also allow us to make inferences from our patterns and therefore link inferences between more big scale versus sort of more um, narrow focused kinds of studies. Okay, so this example is also a good way to argue for that last point, which I think is also a valuable uh, addition that genomic data add. And that's that genomic data are quote unquote unbiased. So I need to be really careful here because I know there's a lot of discussion about bias and lack of bias or how bias uh, is introduced into how we think about our data, how we design our experiments, et cetera. So first of all, let me, let me say what I mean is the genomic data have to actually be good data, okay? And they're biased to some degree or another. And the degree that I mean is that they're impartial with respect to a particular inference or outcome. Not that they can't be influenced by other kinds of biases, but you collect the data and they're impartial to, to your favorite hypothesis, basically. In other words, I think genomic data are, are being viewed as this sort of way of enriching our field because they can change our minds. So the reason I think this is a good example that I've shown here is when James first bought this data, the first inference of the first instance of this data, and I said, oh God, no, that is not what our data look like. Because what we were hoping is this nice clean tree on the left and what we got really was this very rich, complex idea about what was going on in the genomes as they were diverging across the last two and a half million years. And so this, these data are the first data that changed my mind about exactly what's really going on among lineages, including um, making it very clear that these are complex processes and there's no singular, usually there's going to be no singular explanation for how speciation is proceeding, even in individual lineages. So we inferred lots of different processes, including um, that uh, there were other kinds of things that we should start to think about to look at. So not only did it change my mind about how complex this divergent process was in this group, but it also inspired research. And I think that's the sense in which we can think about genomic data being unbiased. So that feeding out from um, that initial, initial analysis, we've gone in lots of different directions. One of the directions is, okay, let's think about integration as more of, a, of an ongoing process that could occur between lineages. And so here's uh, a, a different study done led by Jenna Hamblin, my uh, former postdoc, where we actually looked across lots of different genomes, lots of different trios of different species to, to see, well, what's the patterns of introgression across these different groups? And are they consistent with sort of other biological hypotheses that might help to shape introgression? Okay, so this is the sense in which I think genomes and genomic data can actually provide insights. So everybody makes a joke, oh, another genome is providing insights. Well, I do think they provide insights because sometimes they change our minds and sometimes they lead us in new directions. Okay. So here's the ways in which I think the intuition that one of these bridges, one of these common currencies can, can act as um, a way of linking different um, areas of speciation is because it has these features. And hopefully it will be obvious that these features themselves address some of those gaps that I identified in the beginning um, of this chat. 
um, including the fact that they link across timescales and hopefully they can link across inferences, but also they can overturn some of the expectations that we have with our data. Okay, I'm not crazy um, most of the time. And so well, let me just end by saying, I am also not an unabashed advocate of genomic data in all cases, all the time. And genomic data are not risk-free. They're a great bridge, but they also have risks. So I'm just gonna very briefly for um, complete disclosure, tell you what I think some of these risks are. The first is that these data can be bad. I think all of us have seen really bad genomic data and yeah, they're really bad when they're bad. Okay, so they can be pretty low quality. And I think some of the time when these data are bad, they can be even more risky than other kinds of data because it's really hard to work out how. They're often um, collected in a very bespoke way. They're often analyzed in non-standard ways. And so it's really hard to work out exactly what's wrong with the data set um, in many different cases. Okay, so if you generate bad data, you're also gonna generate bad inferences. So be cautious about good genomic data. The second reason, even when genomic data are really good, they're often really complex. And so they can produce, or they can sometimes be used to justify kind of magical thinking about processes. So um, I think one of the things that we need to be cautious about is using the, these kinds of gen genomic data to support inferences that if we were thinking about them from first principles, we would know were not probably mechanistically sensible. And for that very reason, I think we also need to bear in mind that they're not a replacement for other data. One of the reasons that we, that I feel comfortable with most of the inferences that we draw from the data in my lab is one, we think about them quite a lot. And two, we have other kinds of data. We have natural history data, we have organismal data, we have geographical data, um, we have many other forms of data, reproductive isolation, genetic segregation studies that can help us to interpret the data that we have. So both for sanity checking your inferences, but also for actually answering those broader questions. They can't be a replacement for other kinds of data, but they can help to bridge them. Okay, so in order to, for us to start thinking about how to bridge these traditions so that we're not lost in data, and when we think about down in the weeds and we're not detached from reality where we're sort of looking at these very broad scale patterns, I do think we need to, and should and will, start thinking about how we generate these sets of common currencies, what the common currencies should be, and how we allow everybody access to those common currencies. And I think that's what's really exciting about this integration network. I think that clearly seems to be one of the major goals is like sort out how do we facilitate this fluid or um, free exchange of ideas among speciation researchers so we can be reciprocally enlightened. Okay. So I really, I thank the organizers for um, giving me this opportunity to think about this process and to sort of crystallize some of the ways that I've been thinking about how people talk about um, bridging gaps and how people talk about specifically some kinds of bridges like using genomics. And I also wanna thank very briefly um, the other people in my life, uh, my collaborators, my mentees, um, for provoking me and inspiring me to think widely and pretty deeply about problems in speciation. And that kind of reciprocal exchange of ideas is one of the best things about science. And of course, I would like to thank my funding sources, especially the NSF that's been very generous. And with that, I'm happy to also be done under time. Hurrah. <laughs> thank you very much for your attention. And let me... Let me stop sharing. Let's see if I can do that. Well, thank you so much, Leonie. That was really interesting. Um, if anyone has questions, please put them in the chat or the Q&A. Uh, we have a couple to kickstart the discussion, and then we'll have much more time um, after Daniel's talk uh, to get deeper in the weeds here. Um, but just a first question uh, from Sean Sankowski. Uh, the idea of common currencies is a really great point, which I definitely agree with. Um, in terms of genomic data, do you think we currently have sufficient theoretical understanding of speciation at different time scales to, to really give that currency real value? That is a great question. So actually, I, I'm not really primarily a theory person, um, and I'm not really much of a modeler either. But I think one of the other common currencies is, in fact, 
is in fact models, right? One of the ways that we can translate across things is to think about doing it in a way that explicitly um, addresses uh, how process shapes the data that we're hoping to collect. So I completely agree. I think um, another way to do this is to think about um, bridging this stuff via models. And in fact, models have been extremely helpful to me and to most people when thinking about how to sort out all of this complexity when we generate all of these data. So absolutely. Great, thank you so much. Um, I think we'll move on to Daniel's talk now. So we stay on, on our time targets, but um, if you've put questions in the chat for Leone, we will get to them in the discussion section um, that we'll have uh, after Daniel's talk. So thanks so much. Thanks Liz. Uh, Daniel, yeah, that's, we can see your slides. Yeah, that looks good. So yeah, uh, hello everyone, I'm Chris. Um, and yeah, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, today's second speaker, Dr. Daniel Matute. Daniel's an Associate Professor of Biology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where he and his lab study fundamental questions concerning the genetic and ecological basis of reproductive isolation. So his work frequently involves uh, pioneering studies of Drosophila to address these questions, often combining different approaches, including behavioral, genetic, and comparative uh, studies to explore the causes and consequences of speciation at multiple levels. So as you can see today, Daniel will talk to us about the promise of speciation research as a bridge for micro and macro evolution. And we're very excited to have him with us. So thank you, Daniel, take it away. Thank you, Chris, and thank you so much for having me today. Um, this is truly a great way for me to kickstart the year. Uh, I also want to thank Leonie because she definitely took a, a general approach, a very thoughtful approach on the way that actually speciation research is actually proceeding. I will take a different one, uh, not because I am not thoughtful, but because I would like to actually tell a particular story about how findings that we have had have changed the way that we think about the speciation. I will start the seminar, uh, or what essentially is gonna be a conversation in the same way that I have started pretty much every talk in the last three or four years. Not because this slide is particularly needed for this audience, uh, because, but because I think that it exemplifies the way that we really think about the speciation as a bridge to understand different processes at different time scales. We really think about the speciation as just splitting lineages that I try to accumulate genetic differences over time. And here we have the ancestral population and here we have the resulting incipient populations or incipient species. We really, what we are doing here is actually just depicting a bridge between the variation that happens between within a species to, that, to the partition that eventually occurs and leads to a speciation. That process of splitting is really what we are interested uh, to understand how speciation occurs and how it can connect just different variation at large time scales. About 10 years ago, uh, we started working with Dan Rabowski on a project that was supposed to be just about a few months of our research. And the idea was simple. We were gonna try to connect uh, the rate of accumulation of reproductive isolation in different groups with the rate of speciation that happens in phylogenetic trees. For me, this was, in my mind, this was slam dunk. This was essentially something that was gonna be quick, something that a priori we understood, at least in, in terms of the framework that I had in my mind, that reproductive isolation, really since it is uh, the, the trademark, the currency of a speciation, it should actually just be the limiting factor at which a species accumulated in phylogenetic trees. And much to our surprise, we found that actually there is absolutely no correlation between those two metrics. Really, the rate of species formation in a tree doesn't have anything to do with the rate at which reproductive isolation accumulates in that particular group. After that, publishing that, what is unequivocally a negative result, I was a little bit empty handed. And I didn't really know how to move in order to the gray goal that I had of really understanding how reproductive isolation accumulated over time. And it has not been an easy path, to be honest, to actually think about what is the next step 
and try to think of how to answer that question that this panel actually formulated, how micro and macro evolution are actually connected to each other. That until 2020, when Brandon Cooper and I started thinking about what were the right ways to really try to connect micro and macro. And we formulated a set of uh, questions that were pending in speciation research in a paper that was published in 2020, such as, for example, whether the rate of accumulation of pre-mating and post-mating isolation really support the role of reinforcement or not, or whether the likelihood of hybrid speciation depends on the number of contributing species to a hybrid swarm, and whether that depended on the genetic difference and genetic divergence between those contributing species to the swarm, or the very concept of a speciation gene itself, like what really meant to be in a speciation gene. For the sake of time, I would just focus on one of these questions today. That is the role, the rate of accumulation of pre-mating and post-mating isolation to support reinforcement for a single reason. And the reason is that this is one of the very classical studies on speciation. This paper for the first time, uh, this idea was published in 1989 by Jerry Cohen and Alan Orr in a paper called Patterns of Speciation in Drosophila, which remains one of the breaking points in a speciation research for the simple reason that it was really one of the very first times that the comparative method was applied to um, metrics of reproductive isolation. And the paper is, is hefty, it's, it's a hefty paper that actually takes some time to read and has five or six takes away. One of them, the first one, which was not particularly novel because there were other groups that had, or other studies that had demonstrated already, was that reproductive isolation increases as um, the genetic divergence between the hybridizing species also increases. So there is a monotonic increase in isolation. This probably was one of the first times that micro and macro evolution were connected because if you think about reproductive isolation as a trait that actually is keeping the genetic divergence, the genetic differences between the species apart, really it was trying to connect what happens at a larger time scale. We have revisited, and I think that for every person that falls into speciation research, it becomes a rite of passage to revisit this paper and to do it with their own data. And I, I actually think that that's a great idea. To some extent, we need that level of integration. So we are not an exception, and we have actually done it as well. And we have confirmed that in Drosophila, um, all metrics of reproductive isolation increase with time and increase with genetic divergence. In this particular study that we published in 2018, the only real novelty is that we collected data for post-mating pre-zygotic isolation, but there was really nothing novel in terms of the metrics of behavioral or post-zygotic isolation. This was done, and this was done since the 1980s. What I think that is novel is essentially a compilation of the data uh, that we, that by we, and I mean the royal we, that Jen Coughlin actually led uh, in 2020, and was trying to actually collect and collate all the data that had been published in this very question and try to see whether there were particular patterns. For example, is, is it really a monotonic increase in every clay that we look at? And are there differences in the rate of accumulation of reproductive isolation in different groups? These are important questions, I think, but are questions that remain unknown or remain at least unanswered. And one of the reasons why they remain unanswered is because we don't have a single metric to actually measure reproductive isolation or genetic distance between the species. So here you see that there are nine clades. Uh, and we provide absolutely no comparison because really there is no way to compare the divergence in million years of like a couple of nuclear and mitochondrial alleles with that of NASD of allocytes. But in any case, I think that this, this represents a good entryway to be really thinking about comparative analysis that involve multiple groups. And frankly, it's an encouragement to everybody that is just starting and wants to measure reproductive isolation in their own group, because I think that that data has a tremendous amount of value. But the, the question that I wanted to focus on today was one of the hypotheses of that 1989 paper and was whether actually pre-mating isolation and post-psychotic isolation evolve at different rates and accumulate at different rates in different species pairs. This was one of the very first ideas that actually supported the idea that reinforcing selection 
actually played a role in the formation of a species. And the premise was actually quite clear. If reinforcing selection that affects pre-mating or pre-zygotic isolation more readily than post-zygotic isolation is more important for speciation, then it should be stronger in sympatric species what post isolation should be similar in sympatric and allopatric, simply because, especially in Drosophila, in which there is no impetus to reinforce something like hybrid viability. When a female just gets inseminated and lays an, an egg, there is really no, no impetus to make that embryo more inviable if they're in sympatry. So the expectation was quite clear, and essentially the, the, the initial patterns that uh, the 1989 paper reported were that pre-mating isolation indeed evolved much stronger and much faster in sympathy than in allopathy, as it is shown here in the left panel. Non and that post isolation evolved similar at similar rates in sympathic and allopathic and, and sympathic and allopathic species pairs. This essentially was taken as prima facie of reinforcement, at least for Drosophila. Since the 1989 paper, there has been a tremendous amount of work, a beautiful work that actually has uh, shown that pre-mating isolation does accumulate faster than post isolation in multiple species groups, but there has also been findings that pre-mating isolation accumulates at a similar rate or even slower than post isolation in other groups. This, at least the way that we took this, is that there is a large level of uh, heterogeneity in the way that reproductive isolation accumulates across the tree of life, and that there is not a simple answer, that there is not a, a single answer on the importance of reproductive so of, of a single mechanism that matters for reproductive isolation. This heterogeneity actually made us revisit the very original post, uh, the very original data on reproductive isolation that was collected for Drosophila on the 1989 paper by Cohen and Orr. And what I am showing you here is just a logistic regression on genetic distance and this is important on NACE D that is based on allozymes with reproductive isolation in the, of the pre-mating type. Here I am showing you absolutely nothing new, just essentially it's a reanalysis with some ideas that have been proposed in the literature before. Genetic distance was already published, reproductive isolation was already published, and the idea of actually fixing a uh, logistic regression that was, um, that had an asymptote at the end was already published at least twice by Tammy Mendelssohn and Dean Castillo. So here, essentially just keep in mind that this is just a collation of different ideas of, of previous research. We find uh, a similar result to what Quinn and Orr found, and is that sympatric uh, species accumulate pre-mating isolation much faster than allopatric species. Nothing new here. What becomes curious is what happens when we really look at post-zygotic isolation. What we see in the same, and you, here you have the same axis, genetic distance on the X and reproductive isolation on the Y, is that post-zygotic isolation also accumulates faster in sympatric species than in allopatric species. This is a directly different result to what the 1989 paper actually reported. If we actually look at not only the shape of the figure of the, of, the, of the logistic regression, but we also look at the rate of change, for example, that is represented here by these density functions, we see the same. Sympatric species have a much faster um, rate of change in post isolation than allopatric species. There is a main difference here, and is that we are using the truly seminal compilation of data that Roman Jukilevich put together in 2012 that went from about 150 species of the 1989 paper to over 600 species pairs in a truly gigantic effort to compile metrics of reproductive isolation. And I think that that's quite relevant for a network that actually has the important role, important, met, important goal of actually putting the speciation databases together. The data still has caveats. For example, as I told you clearly earlier, the genetic distance that we are measuring here comes from the 1980s. This is allozymes data set and genetic distance from allozymes. Very, very limited. For that reason, we have actually used 
a much reduced scale data set on reproductive isolation because there are fewer species pairs. But now instead of using naive distance, we're actually using whole genome sequences that were actually led by Anton Suvorov, Bernard King, and Aaron Komal, uh, now at Bangor University. In this effort, they put together over 150 reference genomes that are essentially uh, almost chromosomal level and actually found genetic distances between these species pairs. The goal in this particular study was to find introgression, but this, this is just a resource, resource for the community to just do comparative analysis of many types. And I invite you to just use the data that is freely available. And the pattern holds. The pattern of post-zygotic isolation evolving faster than pre-mating isolation, uh, of post-zygotic isolation evolving faster in sympatric species than in allopatric species holds. So there is something that we have actually missed for over 20 years in, oh my God, for over 30 years already, um, that actually needs to be revisited. Oof, 30 years. If we actually think about it in the way that Leoni was putting it, which I think that was quite eloquent, and is that one way to really look at the speciation is to try to understand what happens in multiple species groups. So we try to do the same, the same type of analysis for Lepidopteran data sets, um, uh, frog data sets that were actually compiled from papers from David Prex Griggs and uh, a paper by Sansa and Norman Johnson. This again, this is data sets that has exi have existed in the literature for some time. Um, but we also find the same pattern. We find that post-zygotic isolation evolves faster in sympatric species. To some extent, this might actually just seem like a kink of the data, right? But I would like to tell you why this matters. Since we are finding that pre-mating and post-zygotic isolation accumulate both faster in sympatry, this essentially just poses the possibility that there are other mechanisms that actually maintain a species uh, in sympathy and that make reproductive isolation in sympathy stronger that are not necessarily reinforcement of pre-zygotic isolation. That is the canonical interpretation that we have for this kind of studies that actually are involve comparative, comparative uh, metrics of reproductive isolation. There are at least two additional, two additional explanations. One of them is that there is reinforcement at the post level. This has been discounted as unlikely because again, as I was saying again, as I was saying before, uh, for an organism like Drosophila that has external development and there is no internal development within the female, there is really no impetus to reinforce something like hybrid viability. There is another possibility uh, and is, that it, is, is the idea of differential fusion. Uh, that was posed since the times of Wallace, but actually Templeton brought it into a more um, expanded view. And the idea is that if you have two populations that have polymorphic reproductive isolation and they are in allopatry, once they come into sympathy, um, hybridization might actually lead to the extinction of those genotypes that are more porous, that actually have, um, lower reproductive isolation. And at the end, what, you are gonna, what is gonna remain in sympathy are only those, well, in the original idea, it was those deems, but I would like to actually think about this in terms of alleles that actually cause reproductive isolation that is stronger. Do I have a favorite hypothesis here? No. Do I know the answer? No, I don't. But I would actually like to think about this in the general terms that we have thought that reinforcing selection was driving the evolution of a stronger pre mating isolation in hybrid zones. That was part of the canon that was essentially written in every, I have written it myself in my papers multiple times. But actually the answer is a little bit more nuanced than that. By no means I am not saying that reinforcement does not play a role. I am saying that it's just not the single the, not, not, it's not the only process that is driving that particular pattern of a stronger reproductive isolation in sympathy. I would like to close just in pretty much the same way uh, that Leone closed, but in a probably less eloquent way. And is that in order to really understand how a species form and to try to bring micro, microevolution and macroevolution together 
we're going to need a lot of help. And we're going to need to borrow from multiple approaches that actually are available already in evolutionary biology, such as phylogenetics, natural history, genomics, experimental evolution, and genetics. Because each of these facets of biology can actually address questions that we have, in some cases, not answered, and we thought that were unanswerable until recently. And in some other, it's actually worth revisiting those that we consider that are canon because new data and new approaches might actually give us some interesting insights that we actually couldn't think of before. With that, I would like to finalize with the people that have been in my lab over the last few years, the funding sources. And if you're interested in this kind of questions, please feel free to contact me. And with that, I would love to take questions. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Daniel, that was brilliant. Um, so yeah, if anybody has any questions, Pete, please feel free to post them in the chat or the Q&A box. Um, um, and while you're doing that, I guess I, I'll just ask one to get us started, if that's okay. So you mentioned there was one slide, which was pretty amazing, like compilation of different data sets of kind of yeah. genetic distance and reproductive isolation. And I completely get the point that I guess lots of those data sets are, are collected using different metrics of different things. So is your, is your view on those things that there, there is no way to kind of quantitatively integrate all of those data sets together? I, I think that there will be soon. Uh, one of the puzzles in my lab, Andrew Zagilis, has been interested in the question of introgression at different phylogenetic uh, or different genetic distances. And we were excited about this question. And I spent some time thinking about it just to realize exactly what Leone predicted, that the data is so variable in terms of quality that it's really difficult to put together and try to just compare because the batch effects are so massive. I think that we are gonna um, reach a point soon in which uh, the quality of the genomic data is gonna be much more uniform and the limiting factor is not gonna be the rate at which we can actually produce sequence, but it's essentially gonna be in this particular case, the rate at which we can, and there, there is a limit right now, the, the rate at which we can actually measure reproductive isolation, for example. Yeah. yeah. So we have some questions from our audience. So Roger says, thanks, Daniel, really stimulating. Many of your RI plots did not seem to go uh, to R equal, RI equals one. Mm -hmm. Is this just an artifact or is it suggesting some other slower process to finish off speciation? Yeah, I think that in this particular case, we were, we were conditioned by a species that we know that to some extent could produce still hybrids, right? So that means that reproductive isolation is not complete, is not absolute. Um, we know that it does get completed. And I think that this is just an artifact of the model fitting more than the biology itself. Yeah, I understand that. Uh, so we have one from uh, Kota who asks, uh, thank you for the summary. Is the actual phylogenetic distance underestimated by introgression in sympatry? Oh, 100%, 100%. This is another possibility that actually we have been trying to disentangle. We measure reproductive isolation, um, and we measure genetic distance, and there is an inherent bias, and is that um, sympatric species have the chance to hybridize, that is a chance that allopatric species just don't on a regular basis, right? So there has to be a factor that tries to determine whether the phylogenetic distance is affected by introgression. Um, we have done some subsampling and some simulations that actually show that at the scale that we are doing it with the genome, uh, with the genome scale distance is not as much as a concern in terms of the of the scale that we are trying to actually use here, and it, even something like ten percent of genetic of introgression uh, doesn't affect the scale of phylogenetic distance that we have for this plot. But it is most definitely a factor, and that has to be especially important for uh, look for studies like the one that I presented and that we have done that actually just use a handful of laws like to estimate phylogenetic distance. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. So uh, Ulrich asks, how do you quantify uh, 
reproductive isolation in your diagrams? Right. Uh, it does depend. It depends on the metric. So uh, and that there is a very rich and varied history of how these metrics have been measured. Uh, by in the very original paper of 1989, there were multiple ways in, for example, which behavioral isolation was a compile. Um, so we have tried, and that was an impetus to, to try to redo the analysis of the 2018 that I said that there was nothing new, but I think that one of the novelties is that we measure, for example, female choice in unified metrics of non-choice experiments, a female and a male, instead of whichever way we could. Uh, for in terms of hybrid, in terms of post isolation, the metrics incorporate uh, hybrid viability and hybrid sterility. The original metric was, I still think a little bit funky in the sense that it involved whether one sex was sterile or inviable and it went in metrics of 0.25s. Uh, and we have done an effort also to try to provide a more fine scale metrics of isolation in that regard. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks. So uh, Mike Ritchie asks, uh, great, well, says great talk, Daniel. Do you think that differential fusion is a more likely process for post-mating isolation than pre? Ah, what a beautiful question. I think that that's the matter of the question that we, that I really would like to answer. I, I don't have an answer. I'm just gonna put it out. I have no idea. But I think that the question that I really would like to address is, what is the relative importance of reinforcement, which clearly matters, of uh, differential future, fusion, which might matter, and of anything that I cannot think right now? Um, so, Mike, I, I don't know. I don't know. Right. So I think we've got, probably got time for one more question here. And so in the meantime, we can probably post the link to the discussion session in the chat so that uh, when the time comes, we can all move over. Um, but so finally here, uh, Catalina asks, well, says, thank you again for the great talk. How different are our costs of mechanisms of pre-zygotic and post-zygotic isolation? Is there patterns across groups on these costs? Ah, interesting. I, I think that that is essentially the next frontier of this comparative analysis is just once we can unify metrics, we can really look at where not only the rates differ, but also whether there is costs that differ between taxa. Great. So, right. Yeah. So I think we should wrap up this talk session now. And well, firstly, to just to say thank you again both Leonie and Daniel for brilliant talks. Um, so Sean has just posted uh, another Zoom link in the chat for the discussion session, which will follow these talks right away. Um, so uh, we can start moving over there now and have a couple of minutes just for a break, and then we can begin the discussion again for those who want to join us. Um, we'll begin again at, 